Keep yourself in the loop of everything football on the Golden State Media Concepts Football Podcast. The latest news on and off the field, be it college football, Big Ten, SCC, Big 12, Pac-12, ACC, to the NFL. We've got you covered. Listen to the Golden State Media Concepts Football Podcast. Tuning in to the GSMC Football Podcast brought to you by the GSMC Podcast Network. I'm your host, DJ Youngs, back again. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. This is a podcast that you can listen to any place, anytime, anywhere. So I like to, you know, cover all of the salutations. So greetings. All right, man. Hey, football world, we just keep getting closer and closer to more exciting days, man. Uh, this is the week. The NFL draft, it's here, you know, when this off season was going on, man, and uh, all we had to look forward to was what's going to happen in the trades and uh, free agency, and then once that was dead and done, then all we could do is speculate till this week, man. It's finally here, like I said, this week, this Thursday, we will finally get the NFL draft, all right? But... Give you the real quick rundown of the episode today, as always, starting with the new news, discuss some things that came about this past week, uh, segment after that, uh, being that the draft is going to be this week, I decided, you know, might as well discuss what the teams are going to be looking for, uh, and then, of course, you know, discuss on their options on who they may pick. Uh, there's a ton of, you know... <laughs> mock draft boards out there so uh like i said i've done one um where we kind of discussed on people that could go places but of course people uh teams have moved up and down the ladder and there's different opportunities now for teams to get different people so kind of kind of go over their needs and who they may get uh that's definitely going to be split between this episode and then you'll begin another episode before day of the draft so that's when the Second half of it is going to be, we're going to do 16 teams and 16 teams. That's how it's going to get split up, all right? After that, we are going to do our final position ranking before draft. This this almost worked out magically to where I finished right before new people. Because like I said, uh, all these lists are based off of individuals that are in the league right now, not counting, you know, projected how, how well a projected rookie might be, you know. So, going to do our final ranking, which will be the running backs. I'll give you the top 10 running backs in the league. And then we're going to wrap it up with the last segment and bring fun facts. But this fun fact is going to be on the NCAA. You've heard the NFL ones before, football generals. Uh, Now, I want to talk more about a little college football fun facts, all right? So, that is how we're going to do it, man. Kicking us off new news, all right? Biggest news since the last episode, the Baltimore Ravens trade Pro Bowl tackle Orlando Brown to the Kansas City Chiefs. No one really saw that coming uh, as far as, you know, one, why get rid of such, you know, a great player? Uh, and then two, why give him to Kansas City, who is a team that is like, you know, in your way of getting to the Super Bowl, right? Or winning a Super Bowl. Um, but, you know, hey, Kansas City's been rebuilding their offensive line so it makes sense for them uh and baltimore clearly is trying to be aggressive in a draft just to give you an idea what they trade them for so in this trade kansas city gets uh o tackle orlando brown okay then they get the 2021 second round pick and they get the 2022 six round pick off from the ravens okay and then baltimore loaded up With, you know, this 2021, they get Kansas City's first round pick. They get their third round pick and their fourth round pick. And then in 2022, the fifth round pick. 
that now brings Baltimore specifically to have two first round picks and then six total picks in the first four rounds. All right. So they loaded up. They're about to go get some talent, I guess, to help out Lamar uh, and get them over that hunt, man. Get that bridge going. Next up, Cowboys. They re-sign restricted free agent, uh, defensive lineman Antoine Woods. Uh, so got him back on there. They moved a couple other people as we've seen. Uh, the Seahawks. They re-sign quarterback Geno Smith. You know, so the backup Russell Wilson. We really haven't seen or heard from Geno Smith in quite some time. So. It is kind of cool to see that he's still in there, you know, hanging. Uh, if you're, you know, a backup quarterback, you know, you, you, that means you're still capable. Because you got to remember there's people we never hear of that are on these teams, uh, but they're on a practice squad and stuff. So when you're at least, you know, still on the travel and you're the person that's definitely next up in case something unfortunate happens to the starter quarterback, I guess you, you still need your flowers. You still need to get, be giving your props. And your team needs to trust you pretty much almost as much as they trust number one. So if – Seahawks are saying they trust G- Geno Smith just as much as Russell Wilson. That's well, not just as much, of course. That's a bit uh, excessive. What I'm saying is enough to finish things off for him. Geno Smith's better than whatever other practice quarterbacks they may have sitting in the background, right? Oh, speaking of quarterbacks, the Browns have exercised their fifth year option for quarterback Baker Mayfield. So, uh, that would extend him through 2022. Uh, give him that extra year. Uh, that's when he'll make 18.86 million. Uh, which I mean, hey, he deserves it. Deserve for him to get his big signing. Which hopefully after that he'll get a you know newer structured deal. Especially uh, if they do as well as I believe. I believe them to win their division at the very least. Uh, last season, uh, Baker, who you know was drafted number one overall in 2018. Uh, he quarterbacked the Browns to their first playoff victory in 26 years. Uh, in that 48-37 win over the Steelers, he passed for 263 yards and three touchdowns as they you know, snapped their 17-game losing streak to Pittsburgh during their first playoff appearance since 2002. So they had not been to the playoffs since 2002, and then they have not won a playoff game in 26 years. And they won this one almost effortlessly against a team that was very good most of the season. A team that went the longest undefeated through the season before finally getting their first loss. uh, And who had a pretty solid defense all season. And they came out balling. Like, if you watch literally the first, it wasn't even just the first quarter. If you watch the first quarter of the first quarter, then you would have been like me where you blinked and you're trying to figure out how were they up by like two touchdowns already. Like they came in rolling. They looked good as a whole Baker. You had a decent season. I'm hoping um, when OBJ comes back that, you know, vision doesn't get foggy and you start going back to your old ways, man. Keep up the good work. Uh, He deserves it. Like I said, I've seen him go from, what all happened to him in college and overcame that, became the first-round pick, didn't have such a good starting point with the Browns, but, I mean, it was the Browns, but he's definitely helped turn that organization around, that's for sure, okay? Uh, West Virginia uh, University is adding two years to coach Neil Brown's contract and extending him through the 2026 season. So another extension on the table for somebody else, but this one is in the NCAA world. Uh, Brown coached the Mountaineers to an 11-11 record in its in his first two seasons, including a six and four mark of in 2020. Uh, he had four years remaining still on it, so like you know, it's just interesting to see that they extended this early. <laughs> but uh, he was hired back in 2019 uh, to replace Dana Holgerson uh, after going. 35 and 16 while he was coaching the four years at Troy Uh, Brown's annual compensation, including his base salary and supplemental compensation will average 3.98 million over a length of the new six year deal. His previous contract, he averaged 3.2. So upgrade a lot. Love to see the dollar signs. I'm sure he's excited about it. Uh, In addition to that, Brown's coaching staff salary commitment uh, also increased by $4 million. I didn't even know, 
you know, I, I always knew the head coaches got paid some big bucks, uh, but I didn't know their coaching staff was, you know, it worked like that. Uh, the salary commitment, and I guess it split up as close to evenly amongst all of them. Uh, it's his coaching staff, you know, his assistant coaches. So that's something I wish I could be doing, man. That's some good money right there. <laughs> uh, but that's what that is, man, making that money as they make, you know, bring all this inventory to these schools these organizations because we all know ncaa period is a billion dollar corporation as they don't pay their athletes nfl commissioner roger goodell this story is entertaining to me that's why i wanted to bring it up because i just think that people are so funny the way that they um report on certain things one and then just what they just believe in so it says um commissioner roger goodell has been vaccinated and will be allowed to hug the players who attend the Thursday night draft. So I'm like, well, I mean, did he get the vaccine specifically for that reason? Or is just there's is that something people look forward to and I didn't know? Or like when you're getting drafted, are you looking forward to hugging Roger Goodell? I I don't think that's the case. But I could be wrong. I could I could be wrong. I don't I don't know why that had to be part of it. They could have just said that he got a vaccine, you know, but they were like, he got vaccinated and he will be allowed to hug people at the draft. Like, I, is that call for applause? Uh, no, I don't think so. But good for him. I'm glad he's being safe out there. Everybody else, you know, get vaccinated, get healthy. So we can have a normal or close to normal world again, but. I don't know why he really reported on the hood part. <laughs> That's the entertaining part to me. Getting back on track. Pittsburgh Steelers cornerback Justin Lane uh, was arrested this past Friday. Uh, he was arrested on suspicion of felony transportation of a firearm inside of a vehicle uh, in Ohio. He was also charged with two misdemeanors, uh, driving with a suspended license and exceeding speed limits. So he was doing 89 in the 60, which was reported. Uh, he did post bond and have court on May 5th. You know, it's tough hearing about, I mean, life is life, you know, people live life. Uh, we do know that a lot of football players come from rough backgrounds, and when they go back home to those areas, they, you know, try to feel safe. You know, he's not the only person we literally have heard about in these past few weeks. I reported on a few other guys that have gotten in trouble with the law uh, after they've gone back home and really haven't even done anything specific like they haven't even been uh in any type of activities it's just that they're you know somehow doing something a little not too smart here and then it just they got to be charged and then that makes it news and you just don't want to have to go through all that so to this young man to uh, all the other guys man we definitely got to be smart as we are out and about uh, in this world uh, during the off season when you're not with your team, you know, twenty four seven doing work. You gotta, you gotta be smart. You gotta be careful. I understand protecting yourself, but you know, doing eighty nine and sixty with a suspended license might have not been the smartest idea there, buddy. Uh, but like I said, um, hopefully that whatever is supposed to come either way. Uh, I hope it goes the correct way, justice wise. And um, I hope this young man gets to keep playing for the Pittsburgh Steelers. All right. So, Gronk made the news again. Not in a bad way. Uh, in as much Gronk style as you can believe it to be. It could be in. But um, So, while he was, he was a guest coach or celebrity coach or however you want to put it, uh, for the Arizona University football team spring game. Him and uh, Teddy Bruschi were the um, coaches that they brought in. You know, Grunk did go there uh, for college. So he's, you know, he's there. And before the game or after the game, I'm not really sure at what point it happened. I believe it was before the game. He decided to go ahead and break a world record. Yep. So what it was is I think the official title is the longest catch so like how far the ball traveled to get caught and uh he says his guinness book world record with 600 600 feet it's a 600 foot catch uh the guys get up in the helicopter they went all the way up 600 feet threw down the football to the field or on the third attempt 
Rob catches it. So, I guess that's cool and exciting. Everybody was hyped to see it. I can only imagine how fast the ball is coming. Like, even if you drop it, like, don't throw it. Even if you just, like, release it from the air. Like, that ball coming down due to gravity is coming with some heat. So, like I said, it was, you know, on the third attempt. But I know that ball was coming with some heat, man. Like, more than a regular bullet ball. Now, if the guy kind of threw it through it, if you watch the video, it kind of actually do like he threw it a little bit. But uh, that's pretty cool, man. Uh, I thought, you know, I mean, it's nice knowing that Guinness is still being able to be broken. Because some of them you hear about, some American music, like, no one's ever going to beat that. But then sometimes you got to think outside the box and be like, well, how can we do the longest pass? From the sky. <laughs> but cool for you. Good job, Rob. So now he's a Guinness Book World Record, um, a future Hall of Famer, Super Bowl winning, tight end, all of that and more. Okay. So after that excitement, uh, Carolina Panthers say they are very open to moving back from the number eight spot in the NFL draft this week. Um, I guess that kind of lets us know that, you know, hey, they're not getting a quarterback, which after, you know, picking up who they got, you you think they still might want a little help depending on who's available. Mm, maybe not. But uh, they apparently have talked with at least five teams about a trade uh, from that number eight spot. Uh, it was specifically said we're very open to moving back uh, by their general manager, Scott Fitter. Or is it Fitter or? <laughs> uh, he said that this past Friday on their uh, pre-Zoom uh, draft conversation. Um, and then he said uh, it just depends on how the first seven picks go. So I think it's going to be a contentional. Like they already discussed with somebody and said like, hey, if this is who we want, if that person is gone, then we're cool with moving. But if they're still there, we're keeping that so we can grab them. Um, which, I mean, I as the other team, like, what are you getting out of that? But those, that's typically, to be honest, how those um, how those trades work. Like, the ones we don't hear about to the day of is because it's contingent on who's going to be available when you get there. So a team who wants to move up to get a specific player might have a couple different options on who they can trade with to get up there. But, of course, they have to discuss with those teams and be like, okay, look, can we get up there? We'll give you this. And it's like, well, we want this person, so uh, we're going to get that person if they're still there. But if they're not there, then we're open to trading for what you just offered. Uh, and that's really how it goes. Uh, the other team that's kind of in the same boat is the Detroit Lions are open to trading their number seven pick. Okay. So, um, yeah, the, the the general manager, Brad Holmes, uh, says that the franchise is open to trading that seven pick. He said, yeah, there has been decisions with other team discussions with other teams. Um, he said that during their pre-draft uh, news conference. He said, I will keep those in-house, but there has been discussions. So, of course, I don't know how people will sabotage it necessarily if it gets out. But, of course, you always want to keep business on the low until it's time to bring it up. Right, which would be in the moment. All right, uh, college football has some new rules, man. They dropped a few of them on us. Uh, so college football teams will be required to attempt two point conversions after touchdowns in the second overtime period of the game rather than the third, according to uh, a change that was just approved. Um, this past week, the NCAA um, playing rules oversight panel decided on a few different rules, and that was like one of the bigger ones. Of course, when you hear that, I don't know about you, but the first thing that comes to my mind is the Texas A&M LSU game that happened, and it was great for people that was just watching. But um, I don't know. I guess some people may have had some complaints. Maybe um, Stanford coach David Shaw, the chairman, the chair of the rules committee, did tell. ESPN in March that the seven overtime game between Texas A&M and LSU in 2018, which the Aggies won 74 to 72, whoop, uh, prompted the discussion to change the overtime rules. So they, you know, was dry hating or something. Who knows? It, as a fan, I enjoyed it. I mean, I was out and about trying to, you know, hang with some friends, but I had that phone just propped up and watching every bit that I can. And people was even like, can you put the phone down? I'm like, dude, I don't think we'll ever see anything like this again. <laughs> Okay, um, 
So the way it works is um, if a game enters a third overtime session, teams will alternate two-point conversion attempts until a winner is determined. Previously, the teams had started uh, possessions on their opponent's 25-yard line for the first four overtime sessions before going to alternative, I mean, alternate two-point uh, plays in the fifth session. So now they're going to move that up so that it can happen a lot sooner. Mm, excuse me. Uh... Other changes approved included permanently extending sideline team areas to 20-yard lines rather than 25, uh, which may give them more room, and including video board and lighting system operators among those prohibited from creating distractions that obstruct play. So they can get in trouble too. But yeah, so 25-yard lines on both ends is where the teams have to stay within, but now they're extending it to the 20-yard line, so giving them a little extra five yards on both ends to spread out a little bit. Um, maybe that's, you know, due to COVID or something. Um, but I know, you know, being on the sideline, even when you got a small team and people get hype running down, following people and stuff, you, you want more room as, as a player, for sure, and coaching staff. Okay, uh, penalizing taunting will be uh, – will be a point of emphasis for officials during the 2021 season. Coaches who leave the team areas and enter the field to debate official calls will receive unsportsmanlike conduct penalties. Uh, the play and rules oversight uh, panel also supported a rules committee proposal that would allow schools or leagues to request post-game reviews and foreign and fang injuries. Okay. That is the update on some of the rules that they basically said that they're going to adopt. All right. Changes on both ends. Um, LSU, who's been in the news unpleasantly, uh, they're in talks with uh, banning running back Darius Geis indefinitely. So uh, they've been struggling to recover from this ongoing sexual harassment scandal that's been going on uh, that involves coach pre former coach Les Miles uh and then now in the process of banning star running back Darius Geis indefinitely from the athletics program in school spokesman uh type like have being able to associate themselves with that. The university also is cutting ties with long term law firm Taylor Porter. Um it's crazy how all this is kinda going on uh and then what's it all about why and just I guess you, you know, they just don't want the connection to the bad publicity, which no one really does. Geis was charged in three separate domestic violence incidences in 2020, and two women accused him of sexual assault while he was a freshman in 2016. A third LSU student alleged alleged in 2016 that Geis had taken a partially you know new photo of her without her knowledge. And showed the picture to his teammates. So a lot of things coming out. So, I mean, I don't think anything's been proven yet. Or, you know, he hasn't went court of law and found guilty. But this is the motions that LSU is trying to take as far as, you know, their connection with him. Uh, as far as Taylor Porter, the law firm um, is based in Baton Rouge. And LSU has been, you know, a client of theirs for the past 80 years. So that is interesting that after all this time, that is, you know, how things are going to end with them. Uh, of course, they didn't let out too much information on, you know, the why. Uh, we didn't get the why behind it, uh, unfortunately. Um, as far as details is, if it's what's all been going on or something that they didn't do on their end or because they helped cover some up from the actual client, not really sure. But hope it all gets figured out and like i said i hope everybody um it goes the way it's supposed to go justice wise everybody get what they are supposed to justice wise all right and then that's really all the news the only thing i want to comment on real quick is in the soccer world there was a big commotion about a few teams getting together to make a super league uh many people weren't excited about that as you can guess uh so it's been you know kind of falling apart <laughs> uh but you know people want to talk about it in the college football space on who they think could fit what 15 teams could get together off a of certain criteria and create a super conference a super league right so everybody has their own uh, i'm gonna give you my 15 teams 
All right. If the, if we were supposed to, if we were to do that in the NCAA football, if you would have to have Alabama, Clemson, Auburn, Georgia, Florida, Texas A&M, Notre Dame, LSU, Ohio State, Oklahoma, Oregon, Penn State, Texas, USC, and Washington. Okay, those are the fifteen that could be in the Super League, and I mean, like, not even just based off of football skills that they get, but like. Imagine the the money bring like those are some of the top money grabbing like Texas, Alabama, Oregon, Notre Dame. Th- those are the money makers right there, and having them all in one place is raining money for sure. All right, okay, so that's the new news segment for you guys. Uh, we're going to move into segment number two after a quick break, where I will be giving you information on 16 teams, what they need in this draft this week, and who are they possibly going to go for. All right, so stay tuned. We'll be right back. Are you looking for help for your fantasy football team? Check out the GSMC Fantasy Football Podcast. Get today's best advice on who to start, who to sit, even who you should draft. From sleeper picks to red-hot lineups, they got it all covered for you. That's gsmcpodcast.com backslash fantasy-football-podcast. We'll cover traditional leagues, dynasty, PPR, even IDP leagues. When you need fantasy help, there's just one show to hit up. Don't forget to like them on Facebook and Follow them on Twitter. Visit gsmcpodcast.com for more info. Patience. I hope you enjoyed that very short commercial break. You are tuned in to the GSMC Football Podcast. I'm your host, DJ Youngs. We just cover new news. All right. And now we're moving into segment number two, where we are going to discuss the team needs. All right. I'm going to start off in the NFC, talk about which all, you know, 16 teams, uh, what should they be looking for, and who's available when they should be picking or who should should who should be available when they are picking and who more than likely will be getting picked by them. At least by what, you know, the analysts and everyone out are going to say. Alright? Give you a couple options though, for sure, of course. Alright. Um we're gonna start off, like I said, NFC, uh, I'm gonna do the NFC East first. Uh the reason I'm not gonna go in order of specifically of the draft is one, because some people are don't even have a first round pick. You got uh, some teams that's in there multiple times because they have the ownership of some people's picks or traded and got you know their pick. So it just you know would be one weird to do it that way, and then two, uh, the very beginning of the draft. You know, a lot of teams are it's kind of obvious who what they're getting slash who they're getting. So uh, just want to mix it up. All right, so. Starting off NFC East, starting off with the most exciting team <laughs> or most uh, famous team, whatever you want to call it, uh, Dallas Cowboys. Uh, their biggest need is definitely defense. They need help on defense. That's where they're getting thrashed. Uh, Dak usually has kept them in games, but he's had to, you know, put up big numbers because he's had to keep up in these games. All right. Um, so uh, their biggest need is specifically a cornerback, especially being that they just lost Byron Jones and Shadobi Awuzie, their starting cornerbacks. But keep in mind, they did have somebody that was on my top 20 list of DBs this uh, last episode. Uh, but they selected Trayvon Diggs in the second round in last year's draft, and he was tremendous this past season. Okay. Um, they have a couple other options still uh, available uh, because they're more experienced. Uh, now it be Jordan Lewis and Anthony Brown. Okay. Uh, but 
like I said, that they that it's obvious that's what they need. Uh, the prospects that everybody is assuming that they're looking at is Patrick Sertain, the second out of Alabama, or J.C. Horn out of South Carolina. Uh, outside of that, their quiet need, of course, is a pass rusher, uh, Demarcus Lawrence and Alden Smith. Well, Alden Smith has moved along, but uh, Demarcus Lawrence uh, can't do it by himself, clearly. So we'll see what's going on over there. All right. New York Giants. Uh, solid offense. I think they got good weapons there. Their biggest need is going to be a pass rusher. All right. To get somebody coming off that ball. They did resign free agent Leonard Williams. Uh, so he should definitely be a help on that D line, but he can't do it by himself, as I said. All right. Uh, some people, some of the prospects for them is, uh, Quiddy Pay. Uh, and that's for out of, he's out of Michigan. And then Carlos Basham Jr. out of Wake Forest. Uh, really getting them in there. A quiet need. An offensive lineman. Keep something a little more solid there to help protect their quarterback. And open up some big, you know, holes for uh, Saquon as he comes back in. I'm sure is going to put on a show. All right. Uh, then we got the Philadelphia Eagles. Philadelphia Eagles um, do have their new, well, not new, but. You know, got their quarterback that they're trusting in right now. Apparently, it's, you know, up for the positions up for winning. But um, being that we saw Jalen Hurts perform quite a bit uh, toward the end of the season and do pretty well for them, uh, I see him winning. All right. Uh, They did, you know, uh, they knew they would, you know, they lost with veterans Deshaun Jackson and uh, Alshon Jeffrey. Um, So. They need a little bit more. They need some help. Uh, somebody. Oh, something else I meant to. I forgot to mention is where the people that I've already discussed and am discussing land on this draft board as of now, before any trades may come about. Okay, so real quick, uh, the Cowboys starting there. Dallas Cowboys have the tenth pick. And the New York Giants have the 11th pick. Philadelphia had originally, you know, been a little higher, but they moved down to the 12th pick. Okay, so interesting enough that, you know, all of the NFC East is pretty much all together right there. Uh, So, you know, seeing who your direct rival is going to be picking or pick right before you is going to be important. But, I mean, you still can't go from what you are going to need. So, uh, Eagles being there at 12, they're hoping to get them a solid receiver. Uh, prospects of people that should hopefully still be there for them to pick up at that position would be Jalen Waddle out of Alabama or Rashad Bateman out of Minnesota. Okay. Uh, a quiet need is a linebacker. Definitely need somebody to hit them holes and get in there, man. It'd be interesting enough. To, I wouldn't be surprised if they, you know, get Micah uh, Parsons out of Penn State first instead of getting a receiver. That would be the opposite end of that. Okay. Washington football team, biggest need, a left tackle. They need somebody to be back there. I mean, will be up front protecting uh, Fitzmagic, their new quarterback, uh, you know, really making sure that, you know, he's in good hands. Prospects that they may be looking at to fit in there will be Christian Darasaw out of Virginia Tech or Tevin Jenkins out of Oklahoma State. Uh, quiet need as a linebacker. Definitely need some, you know, they really need a defense general. Uh, as of right now, uh, I feel like their DN slash linebacker and chase uh, young man, but I put, I think he'll be a captain, man. I think he'll get it done. He can be that lieutenant till, uh there's somebody else. <clears throat> okay, moving over to the NFC North, the Chicago Bears. <sighs> they They need a quarterback, obviously, guys. I mean, it, it, they, it's obvious that they had their woes, even though they had some solid ones, man. You thought they would have had it together. Uh, also, note real quick, rewind, rewind. Watch the football team is picking number nineteen. Okay. <laughs> now, talking about the Chicago Bears, who are picking in the first round at twenty. They have the number twentieth pick, and at that pick, they should be looking for a quarterback. Uh, who would be available for them to get at that moment to take over their league? I mean, 
I think Kyle Trask. So the thing is, they had Nick Foles. That 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 is somebody I guess they don't believe in. They so they added Andy Dalton after getting rid of Mitchell Trubisky, and I mean, I'm I'm sorry, but uh, that's tough. <laughs> okay, uh, but yeah, so they should be looking at somebody like I said, uh, Kyle Trask out of Florida, even though he had a really great season, led in um, yards passing in the NCAA. I think they. I don't know. He hasn't been getting a lot of recognition, so he could definitely still be there. Uh, somebody else that people believe in is Kellen Mond out of Texas a and So, I mean, I don't know. I'd like to see him play in the big league and actually surprise me if he can. Um, but I'm not going to lie. If he gets picked 20th in the first round, that itself would be just a surprise by itself. And then at that point, then I expect more from him. From him. Another need they need is offensive linemen just to, you know, help out on that end. Uh, word has it that um, it's not too much belief over there. Um, giving you an idea um, of like what's going on with them. Like Jermaine Fetty was the Bears' best tackle in 2020, but he was you know traditionally he he has traditionally been uh, in figures to again you know he ex- expected to get better this upcoming season. So that'll be what they'll have. Okay, um, Detroit Lions, uh, after losing Galladay, Marvin Jones Jr. in free agency, um, they need a wide receiver. They need somebody to go help poor Jerry Goff, who just ended up up there. Uh, they need to go for somebody that's going to help them get the ball in the end zone. Uh, we discussed that when I was saying they're making their way to the top, what they would need, uh, what kind of assistance is they're going to need, and... I think they are going to need a strong one. Uh, they have the number seven pick, but as reported earlier, they are in discussions of moving. I don't think that would be the wisest. I think they might need to stay there and see if they can get a Devontae Smith from Alabama, uh, Jamar Chase, LSU, uh, if the Rashad Bateman out of Minnesota is still there. Um, mm, you know, hey, hey. And then on top of that, I mean, how much faith do we really have in Jared Goff? You might need to grab a quarterback who could be available at seven. Will Justin Fields still be there? Trey Lance still be there? I mean, look into it, guys. Green Bay Packers, who almost look like they are just, um, they don't need anything because they're so well-rounded. Um, it, it, um, it may seem, you know, weird just because they got Jared Alexander, who's one of the best corners in the game. Okay. Uh, and two of their DBs made it on my defensive top 20 list, defensive back list. Uh, but, I mean, the number two corner on our team, Kevin King, who's ranked 54th among positional qualifiers, uh, he was getting roasted. We was watching him get roasted his last game uh, that they had before getting kicked out the playoffs. And it um it might be time to replace him. Yeah, I might need to get somebody in there to help that that out. But I mean, again, this is a team that was so solid uh, that really you can still go with the same team that they have, and it won't be too disappointing. Green Bay pick, Green Bay Packers pick at number twenty nine. So of course they're not going for some of that like the most elite offensive talent that might be available, but defensive, especially at a, a DB position, I believe you could still get a top three cornerback. That would be available. Uh, could be Greg Newsom the second out of Northwestern or Asante Samuel out of UCF. Uh, that's the ones that are people expecting. Something else they could look at is an edge rusher. They don't really have uh, the biggest uh, effect with getting back there to disrupt quarterbacks. Minnesota Vikings. Uh, they, they need somebody to help with the offensive line. They had a, a good run game this past season, so I think they can just you know upgrade that. And keep up the good work there. Uh, they picked number 14 in the first round. Okay. So, some uh, offensive linemen they should be looking at are Sean Slater out of Northwestern or Aljavar Tucker out of UCLA, who's, I believe, like number one, number two ranked in that position. But, yeah, help Kirk Cousins out, man. Make sure he's not back there getting slaughtered. Uh, someone else, something else that they can um, – Looking to outside of offensive line is an edge rusher, which a lot of teams need. They need people that can get back there. If you're not over here looking like the Cardinals, 
you know, loaded up or the Browns loaded up, then you, you need to, you know, add some more weight to it. All right. Okay. NFC South. Atlanta Falcons need a little bit of everything. <laughs> but let's just keep them from getting scored on and say they need a safe D. Okay. With Keanu Neal, Ricardo Allen, and Demonte Kazi all departing in the same offseason. They need a little help over there, y'all. Just a tad. Uh, help them out. The uh, Falcons. Excuse me. <clears throat> the Falcons pick at number four. Now, they could go for a quarterback, but Matt Ryan, didn't, he didn't, he's on like he's falling off. Okay? Uh, so, my thing is, go for what could help him out, which would be some on defense because he got weapons. He do. He got offensive weapons. He got at least enough to get the job done. So go over there, look for Trayvon Morid out of TCU, Javon Hollard out of Oregon. Just get somebody to help. I mean, you could still go and get, you know, a quarterback if you think so, if you're not really trusting in Matt Ryan, because, I mean, this is a really good position y'all are in right now. Uh, Make something happen. Um, But, yeah, what you don't need is with Julio Jones, with Calvin Ridley, you, you don't need. Uh, a receiver okay so go out there and do the right thing Carolina Panthers defense alright they're figuring out what they want a quarterback this is another team that is talking about moving back they have the number 8 pick right now but they're talking about moving it so if they don't get who they want which hopefully is a safety but, but the thing is with the safeties uh, the individuals that they can get, they can get later on. So that's why it'd probably be interesting for them to steal some people or something else important from another team, uh, get pushed back, get uh, a safety like um, safety out of Syracuse, Andre Cisco or Demar Hamlin uh, out of Pittsburgh, and run from there, Carolina. Run from there, okay? Um, the New Orleans Saints. I don't think they necessarily need a quarterback. I think we should see what Jameis or Taysom is going to do for them first uh, in the scheme. Um, but maybe they might need a little more help with wide receiver. Michael Thomas did get kind of hurt last season, and hopefully he'll be back. But outside of him, who do we have? I mean, it's been addressed a little bit, but not enough. Um, you know, uh, Emmanuel Sanders is gone, so they don't have him anymore. Well, actually, they did. They 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 signed Emmanuel Sanders after away from the 49ers, trying to get him some help. But the current number two target is uh, Traquan Smith, and he hasn't really had you know too big of a breakout. Drew Brees is gone. You know, get some get get somebody in there, assist with that a little bit. Uh, the Saints, they are going to pick at number twenty. They have the number. 20 it oh no i'm wrong i'm sorry 28th sorry 28th pick that's when they'll be getting at it so we gotta think about who's gonna be available that late receiver wise uh that's gonna be tough i mean again somebody rashad baby keep bringing him up out of minnesota i think that's honestly the best bet um it's also been mentioned that maybe they can get terrence marshall jr at that point they also could use a little help on defense maybe not defensive line maybe go for a linebacker uh, Tampa Bay, they just, they don't need anything. <laughs> I think they're good. Uh, word on the street is they can get some more defensive depth, but their defense is so good. Uh, some people that they said they could possibly look into is Christian Barmore or Joseph Osai. Uh, that's an uh, Alabama player and Texas player. Uh, but, you know, like Green Bay won, so they get the very last pick, the 32nd pick. And uh, it's been talks to, like, oh, should they get – what quarterback? What if quarterback's available to, you know, take over for Tom Brady afterwards? Ah, I don't think so. You're picking that late, and um, you'll do better, like, trading for somebody or getting – if you're going to move up because I don't know if a franchise quarterback is going to be at 32. I, that's just me personally. I could be wrong. I could be definitely wrong. Uh, You know, I'm human. All right, moving over to the NFC West. West is the best – I don't know who's I'm saying that. All right. Uh, Arizona Cardinals. Arizona Cardinals is a team that has been building the right way. I like what I've been seeing from them. Okay. Uh, but 
they could need they could use a little help on defense specifically. Um, I, I like their pick last year. I like you know them adding depth on that defensive line. Okay, uh, they have the number sixteenth pick, so right in there is a good time to get you a cornerback. All right, all right, because um, you gonna need a little more help. They did sign free agent Malcolm Butler. Uh, from Tennessee, who is somebody that I had, was on my top 20 list. So I think that's a solid pickup. But at that pick, you might want to see, hopefully, you know, J.C. Horn uh, out of South Carolina is there. You can get him. I don't think Patrick Sertan is going to be there anymore, but we know he's a, you know, top candidate. Uh, he should be going to Dallas, but we'll see there. Uh, but they can also really maximize getting possibly a tight end. Um, I don't know who <laughs> even number, number two would even be at the Kyle Pitts because – Everybody only talks about Kyle Pitts. Um, but that would be the move. Los Angeles Rams, who just got their quarterback, they paid a lot of draft capital for their quarterback. So, guess they don't really need anything on offense because they also have a great receiving uh, group. So, going to defense, uh, secondary will be solid. That's, that, that's what we would believe it should be. Uh <laughs> Or what the opportunity they should get should look like, um, but they are in a bracket in a division that, like I've, I've discussed, like this is top two most competitive divisions. So that means you got to come in there with the right mindset, with the right people, uh, with the right attitude. Okay, so the Rams, who I believe don't even get a first round draft pick. Yeah, because Jacksonville has their draft pick. So, they don't even get one. I guess that means they're also very comfortable with their team. But, no. Who do you need to get? You need to get secondary. You need to look into who's going to be available in the second round if you can get them. Uh, Aaron Robinson out of UCF or Eric Stokes out of Georgia are people that are favored to eventually be picked by the Rams to help them out. San Francisco 49ers also need secondary help. Edge rushers uh, need to get back there. You know, they they took the most injuries, but hopefully they bounce back, get Kelvin uh, Joseph out of Kentucky, uh, Eric Stokes out of Georgia. It's a great secondary assets. Their top cornerback is uh, Jason Verrett, who missed three games this last year after hitting a the field only six times from 2016 and 2019. That's tough. Uh, Kawan Williams missed eight games. Uh, Emmanuel Mosley missed four. So, pretty beat up team, man. Uh, hopefully, they can bounce back. Seattle Seahawks are also in the same market as you see. The biggest, the, the biggest demand is definitely going to be cornerbacks for this draft. Uh, so, Seattle Seahawks, you know, the offense is. <laughs> The offense is good. They 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 good over there. So they they don't need no help in that division if you ask me. But unfortunately, Seahawks also do not have a first round pick as their number twenty three pick belongs to the New York Jets. All right. Um, so they gonna have to roll with what they got. But when they do get the pick, maybe they'll get a DB who's available. Aaron Robinson at UCF or Eric Stokes out of Georgia. Uh, by that time, I don't know. I doubt it, though. But we'll see. <laughs> um, and that concludes the NFC. All right. So that's what we got for the teams. That's who they should be looking at getting. All right. Like I said, this is the first half. We're going to do the next half on the next episode, which is actually going to be on draft day uh, when that is released anyway. So you'll have the full list of the order before the draft on what the order is of people have an idea of what your team or just the teams in your division are looking to get or should be looking to get uh but as i told you before do not just base that off of this because the draft is so unpredictable anything can happen all right so hey real quick we're gonna take a break we're gonna come back and i'm gonna give you the top 10 running backs in the league all right so stick around Tired of searching the vast jungle of podcasts? Now listen close and hear this out. 
There's a podcast network that covers just about everything that you've been searching. Hey. The Golden State Media Concepts Podcast Network is here. Nothing less than a podcast bliss with endless hours of podcast coverage. From news, sports, music, fashion, cooking, entertainment, fantasy, football, and so much more. So stop lurking around and go straight out to the Golden State Media Concepts Podcast Network. Guaranteed to fill that podcast itch. Whatever it may be, visit us at www.gsmcpodcast.com. Follow us on Facebook and Twitter and download us on iTunes, SoundCloud, and Google Play. tuned in to the gsmc football podcast i am your host dj youngs man i just mess with y'all all right hey so far so good halfway through man talked about some big news talked about some big moves some teams need to make this upcoming week and now we're about to talk about our last position ranking of this season man uh it's been a good one talking about all these great players in every position and now we're at the end going for the last position on the field that I have not discussed yet, and that is the running back. Man, the running back one is <sighs> running backs we love, you know, just as quarterbacks. We love seeing quarterbacks, you know, make things happen with receivers. We like running backs because they make things happen any way they want to, running, maybe catching. Uh, a lot of them are returners. All of that, but the thing is, the running back is the most used player on the field and so because of that a lot of them typically have shorter you know career spans um you know they or they get beat up real bad and then you know uh they're just backups for a long time after that uh big on practice team stuff like that man uh but you can definitely see based off of what these guys that I'm going to talk about today get done on the field while they are there, regardless if it's past their prime, they're in their prime, or they are fresh out of the womb, ready to go and get at it, okay? So, before starting off with my top 10 list, I am going to do two honorary uh, guys because I, these are two people that are still playing that have, you know, been those guys for so long like really they have married just based off of their name regardless of what they are doing uh numbers wise okay first individual i want to recognize is adrian peterson okay adrian peterson was drafted number seven overall back in 2007 out of oklahoma okay now he's been a long time he's with the minnesota vikings for so long which is who uh drives him at number seven he was with them for so long before ending up in so many different places. Moving around, went to in 2017 uh, after leaving New Orleans, went to Arizona Cardinals, then Washington football team, Detroit Lions now. Man, but hey, this guy here is the GOAT. So uh, I'll give you his career stats thus far. Um, in rushing, out of 180 games that he played in, he has attempted... 3,192 rushes. He has accumulated 14,820 rushing yards. Uh, emphasis on his 2012 comeback after tearing his ACL the season before. Uh, but coming back and doing a 2K season 
All right. Impressive. He's one of the few that gets to hold that title. Uh, and on top of that, he has 118 touchdowns. That is just rushing. Looking at the receiver, because we all know receivers. You know, I mean, running backs get to come out of it from back there and be receivers. So out of those 180 games, he do have 2,466 receiving yards and six touchdowns. All right. Adrian Peterson, man. A hey, salute to you, my brother. You are just the GOAT, all right, easily, all right? And the other person I want to recognize who have been doing it even longer than Adrian is Frank Gore. Frank Gore, unfortunately, currently plays for the New York Jets, but it didn't always start that way. Uh, He was drafted back in 2005 in the third round by San Francisco uh, out of Miami, okay, and he played with San Francisco for a long time before ending up in Indianapolis for three years, and then going to Miami, Buffalo, and now the Jets uh, these last three years. All right. But, hey, out of 241 games, he has 16,000 rushing yards, okay, and 81 touchdowns. Receiving-wise, he, he has 484 receptions. For 3,985 receiving yards and 18 touchdowns. Okay. Uh, Frank Gore is on, you know, all kinds of record-breaking lists uh, for how long he's been doing this in this league, man. And he definitely needed to be recognized while I'm going to sit here and talk about these 10 guys. All right. Now, Frank Gore, Adrian Peterson, we salute you two legends. Now it's time for my top 10, man. These guys here have been balling either the past season, season before. I mean, you know, it, this is going based off the last three seasons, okay? Who have been at the top of their game, handling their business, that are currently playing on a roster, moving in that direction still. So if you was cold three years ago and then you ain't been cold since then, of course not. But I'm talking about guys that still have it or just got it. And how it's looking moving forward for them. All right. Number 10 on my list. This one's a young guy. All right. But, hey, he is definitely on his way to being goated. All right. And that individual is no one other than Jonathan Taylor. All right. He was just drafted back in 2020 in the second round to Indianapolis uh, out of Wisconsin. And I remember he was doing his thing at Wisconsin. All right. Uh, But, yeah, JT, man, uh, his first season he played in 15 games. Uh, rushed 232 times for 1,169 yards and 11 touchdowns. That there, sir, deserves its flowers alone. Uh, uh, congrats to you. Uh, I'm hoping to see, you know, more of this. I don't know how much more. I mean, you know, now that we know which quarterback is and what all is going to happen, but that there is dope. I mean, out of receiving, he had 36 re- uh, receptions for 300 yards and one touchdown. Okay. That's JT for you at number 10. My number 9. My number 9 is somebody that uh, definitely made people believe in him, I believe. Um, As far as, you know, I I don't know how many people have felt the same way when he first got in. Okay. That brother is none other than Josh Jacobs. Okay. Josh Jacobs drafted just back in 2019 in the first round out of Alabama to then the Oakland Raiders, now the Las Vegas Raiders. Um, This guy has had some good, solid seasons these past two seasons he's been with them. And, I mean, he hasn't even played a whole an entire 16 games either season. That's the crazy part. But Josh Jacobs, in his first season, he only played 13 games. Uh, rushed for 1,150 yards for seven touchdowns. This past season, he decided to go play 15 games, so a little bit more, but still one short of an entire season, a regular season, that is. And on 273 carries, he had 1,065 yards and 12 touchdowns. So he's at least getting in the end zone, man, strong guy, uh, definitely a solid runner and only getting better. I think he'll hit his problem this upcoming season or next year uh, for sure, okay? But he's just kicking us off here, right? Number nine, Christian McCaffrey. 
the Carolina Panthers superstar was drafted back in 2017, first round, eighth overall pick out of Stanford after he put on a show as he was going for his Heisman run while he was there, man, doing big things there. Young guy, uh, definitely in his prime. What's great about Christian is, bro, he's literally more than running back. Like, he can easily be a slide receiver, man. Like, you, he's so versatile. He has good hands. But uh, just looking at the rest of where he did get injured this past season, so he only got to play three games. But looking at his first three seasons with the Carolina Panthers, he played in every game. He's had, uh, except for his rookie year, had a thousand yard seasons, uh, both in 2018 and 2019. And in 2019 specifically, he rushed for 1,387 yards and 15 touchdowns. So currently, uh, including his three games that he played in his 2020 season and his five touchdowns, he has had 3,145 yards over 51 games and 29 touchdowns. All right. That is Christian. I mean, they paid him. They plan on keeping him, of course. That That's what it's looking like. Going on to number eight on this list. This individual is definitely somebody that's been slept on because he was slept on coming out of, well, I, I, people knew he would get picked, but, I mean, he wasn't a first-round pick. And then he got to this team, and this team is just, they had a lot of things going on, but they made their way around, and he is a significant reason for it. That person is running back Nick Chubb for the Cleveland Browns. So, like I said, drafted back in 2018 in the second round, 35th pick uh, to Cleveland out of Georgia. All right, so he was doing his thing at Georgia. So that's why we knew he was going to get picked up, but he wasn't ranked as the top running back or even second uh, top running back, but since he's been in Cleveland, all right, this past season was the only season he didn't get to play an entire sixteen games. He also it also was his first uh, season where he was sharing that running back position with Kareem Hunt uh, as they alternated. Um, but this guy has had thousand yard seasons the entire time. I mean, literally four yards short uh, his rookie season, but we're gonna still count that as a thousand yard season. All right, thousand yard seasons each year. <laughs> okay, uh, and. He gets an insult, and he's a strong back, man. Nick Chubb has played in 44 games. He has 3,557 yards uh, and 28 touchdowns. This past season, he had 12 touchdowns. So, hitting them holes, pushing it through, getting back there in the end zone for sure. Okay? So, so far, that's JT at 10. Uh, Jacobs was at 9. Christian McCaffrey at 8. Nick Chubb at 7. Okay, moving on to numero seis, number six, man. This one was tough because I really wanted to put him higher. But due to injury this past season, we didn't get to see him as much, man. And that person is Saquon Barkley. Yes, I know you would expect him to be higher. That's what you thought you were going to see here. I get it. Uh, But like I said, when you combine in, you know, the time this season was big in a running back game. The running backs put on the show this season. Okay? Uh so being that, you know, Saquon unfortunately, you know, really messed up his leg, man. Uh severe injury. He didn't get to keep up with that trend, okay? Uh but he's still Saquon. All right. We see still a guy who's had thousand year seasons, the first two seasons in the league, played all 16 games first season, only 13 second season, uh, but put up some big numbers, man. Uh, 2,300 yards he rushed for, um, 11 touchdowns first season, six touchdowns second season. Like I said, he got injured literally in his second game um, of the season this past season, so we didn't get to see enough from him, but we know what there is to come. Okay, uh, Saquon was drafted back in 2018, second pick overall out of Penn State. We knew this is what <laughs> uh, New York really needed, man. They got themselves a quarterback, they got themselves a running back. They made some moves. Uh, I discussed in the last segment what they need to go out there and grab. So hopefully that'd be the case. Uh, but yeah, I, I think I think this is somebody that you want to definitely look out for. Um, Coming into this upcoming season, he should be doing some big things for them coming back healthy, man. All right. Now it's time for the top five, man. One, two, three, four, 
five. Okay, these these individuals here. Put them where you want. I got them in this order based off of past merit and what I think they're still capable of. Okay, that that, that that's that's what that that's what I'm going based off of. All right, so my number five is somebody that really needs to channel. I don't know, he might need to do some meditation before games, but really needs to channel what he's had in the past so that he can capitalize on it moving forward. Because I think these people, his fans, are tired of the up and down. They want that consistency. And that number five on my running back list is Ezekiel Elliott. All right, running back for Dallas, uh, drafted fourth overall back in 2016 out of Ohio State. Zeke, man, he put up some big numbers, man. He went, he ran 1,600 yards his uh, first year, 15 touchdowns uh, in 2018 at 1,400 yards, six touchdowns in 2019, 1,300 yards, 12 touchdowns. So over his five seasons in the league thus far he got paid he played in 71 games uh 71 games has rushed for over 6300 yards and has gotten 46 touchdowns that's just rushing on the receiving end he has had 241 receptions for 2000 yards and 10 touchdowns all right so z what are you gonna do man last season you didn't get the thousand you stopped that 979 yards. You got six touchdowns. This season, I'm predicting you to go 1,200 plus. Okay? You should at least do that uh, with the the play action that y'all should have available. All right? And you should get at least eight touchdowns. We'll see. But that's number five. Number four. This person that really uh, tag team with his name twin. And made some big things happen for this team. That's Aaron Jones. Aaron Jones got drafted in 2017, fifth round. So, all the way at the bottom. Uh, 182nd pick <laughs> uh, out of UTEP to the Green Bay Packers. And he's been balling with him, man. He Look, like I said, he's had a very good season this past season, if you ask me. Okay, out of his, out of his time, while he's been with the Green Bay Packers, uh, talking about this season that just passed specifically because it's really just been the last two years he's really had a chance to take off take off but this past season he only played in 14 games so he didn't get to play in two and on 200 attempts he had 1,104 yards for nine touchdowns season before he went off to 16 games played 1,000 yards 1,084 yards 16 touchdowns so continuously in the end zone with a quarterback like Aaron Rodgers Standing in front of him, man, handing it off to him, uh, passing it down to him uh, when needed. It, it's no surprise if you ask me that Aaron Jones is on this high on the list. Okay, receiving wise, he's had 131 receptions uh, for over a thousand yards and six touchdowns in his career. All right, three of those were added to that. T- t- uh, three of those added on for that 2019 season. So almost 20 touchdowns he was responsible for that season. So, Aaron Jones is that guy still. Next up, we're now entering the top three. All right. The top three running backs in the league right now. Number three, drafted in 2017, second round, 41st pick to Minnesota, Dalvin Cook. Dalvin Cook went to FSU. Dalvin Cook has been running the ball down people's throats. Okay, this past season, only played 14 games. Didn't even play 16. Only played 14 and was second in rushing yards for the season. All right, just imagine if he had that too. He, he might have he really done something. But he got 1,557 yards, counted for 16 touchdowns. That was just this season. Oh, what happened the season before? Oh, he played 14 games again. Oh, what did he do about the same or what? Oh, well, he got 1,000 yards, 1,135 yards, uh, and 13 touchdowns. So just in the last two seasons alone, he has 29 touchdowns. That's not including his first two, which were, you know, okay. I mean, he wouldn't use the same, so uh, it's a lot less. But his career thus far uh, accounts for some pretty good stuff, man. 43 games, uh, 3,661 yards. 
and 33 touchdowns in four seasons. Uh, receiving wise, he has had 148 receptions for 1,275 yards and three touchdowns. Dalvin Cook, hey man, keep it up. I like seeing you up here. Top three, top two. I mean, y'all can see y'all see where we're going. I'm pretty sure y'all still got people on your list. Like he hasn't said these person yet. So which is which? Number two for me. On my top running back list going into this season, not including the young boys who are about to get drafted, this individual was drafted back in 2017 in the third round, 67 pick overall, man, 67th out of Tennessee, running back Alvin Kamara, all right, Alvin is just the most elusive running back in the game right now, uh, dual Running back, because he's running back slash receiver, kind of like what I said about Christian McCaffrey. But this is the guy that is making it look so easy. He's had some crazy games, man. Scoring four touchdowns. and st- Oh, my goodness. Okay, let's talk about his stats, man. 60 games he's played in. He's literally only missed, what, three, three, four games his entire uh, career. All right. So, man, he does. what's crazy is since he do it both ways, he don't just have any like he does he's not up there on rushing yards but this past season I was his most he PR personal record and on his uh on his rushing yards and rushing touchdowns so this past season 15 games only 932 yards okay but that's most he's got almost 1000 and he has 16 touchdowns. That's because he also do a lot of receiving. All right, so 60 games played in his career, 3,340 rushing yards, and 43 touchdowns. So he has 16 this past season, uh, and 14 in the 2018 season. Uh, receiving wise, 326 receptions in his career for 2,824. Yards, which is the most out of the guys that I've named thus far, and he has 15 touchdowns on top of that, so he had five touchdowns uh, this past season, uh, receiving wise. And look, look, that that gets added to the rushing, which puts him over 20 touchdowns for this past season. And then on top of that, he's also on uh, kickoff, kickoff return, he do some punt returning. Uh, he didn't, he hasn't scored since his rookie year, but you know, he still puts. Yards in there, man. He still gets out there. Like I said, this guy's elusive. Like, I don't know what. This is the guy that, that I would want to play with if we were playing, like, some pickup football, man. And number one is, yes, it should, I'm not even going to play with y'all with this one because it should be obvious. It's Derrick Henry, man. Derrick Henry is the lo- local guy that just runs over everybody like a freight train. He wouldn't draft until the second round, but I mean, he came out of Alabama, so again, somebody else that people knew uh, was going to get picked, but he didn't get to get used much in his first two years. They kept him in the background, man. Wasn't even starting him. It was real quiet around there. Then guess what happened? As soon as they put that boy out there, man, 2018, he got out there, rushed for a thousand over a thousand yards, 12 touchdowns. 2019, back again, Get a few more yards, so I'm going 1,500 yards this time. So he got 15 yards, 16 touchdowns. Okay, so getting up there. And then this past season, he got in there and went for the 2K, man. 2,027 yards rushed, 17 touchdowns. Dang. That's wild. Real wild to me. Like, Come on, man. First of all, let me give his kudos because 2000 is a big deal. I mentioned it before on the show that that is not an easy club as people may seem because it's only a few individuals that's been able to do it, man. Okay, only eight of them now. All right, so back in the first person to do it back in 1973 was O.J. Simpson, who ran for 2003 yards with the Buffalo Bills. Uh, Then in 1984. Uh, Eric Dickerson with the Los Angeles Rams, who holds the uh, largest, holds the biggest regular season rushing yard record, and that's 2,105 yards. Then 97 came around, uh, and Barry Sanders was that guy in Detroit, rushing for 2,053 yards. 1998, Terrell Davis, while he was on the Denver Broncos for his short term there, ran for 2,008 yards. 
Then Jamal Lewis did it with Baltimore in 2003, rushed for 2,066 yards. Chris Johnson, you know, this is where my memory and recollection is starting to come in from the stuff I got to witness. But Chris Johnson, who was like the fastest dude on earth, uh, rushed for 2,006 yards yards with also with Tennessee. So we see Tennessee got that eye. Uh, and then Adrian Peterson, who I mentioned earlier, did it back in 2012 with 2,097 yards. And now in 2020, they will you get to add Derek the King Henry. All right. Also, just to note his uh, receiving stats, he has had 76 receptions for 692 yards and three touchdowns. All right. So, shout out to those men there, man. Those are some guys that are really making the game fun to watch. So, I appreciate y'all. I appreciate everybody for sticking with me uh, through these position rankings, man. I hope I didn't upset you too much. I hope that we can agree on some things. If not, oh, well, what I always say, go argue with somebody else. (laughs) But, hey, it's time for a quick commercial break and then we're going to come back and jump into the last segment and just you know do a little bit of learning man i'm going to talk about some things that you may or may not have known uh about the ncaa all right so we'll be right back this is your ultimate stop for everything sports the golden state media concepts sports podcast should i say more from the nfl mlb the nba to mma it's all in here the golden state media concepts sports podcast listen now back ladies and gentlemen thank you for making it this far man we're on the last segment uh we talked about new news we got into some team needs uh coming up in the draft this week and then we also discussed the top top 10 running backs in the league right now who they are what kind of compliments have they had we just so happened to have a 2k accomplished running back this past season so definitely have to highlight him and he is the number one running back in the league that is Derrick Henry now it's time for a little fun a little knowledge man some stuff you may or may not have known I want to do some fun facts on the NCAA uh and hear some of those good stories and things we may not have known all right uh, I want to shout out to footballbabble.com uh, that's where I'm getting a lot of this information for from uh we're just going to kind of go through it i kind of want to learn with you guys i like learning so instead of you know screening them and everything like that i was like man let's all jump into it together and uh (laughs) do some in time reactions all right so starting off uh with some orange bowl facts the first orange bowl was played in 1935 between the university of miami wow no surprise and manhattan college and to save money the man manhattan college team took a three-day boat ride to Miami. So I guess that's, you know, just before the play trips and uh, even a bus ride that I guess usually uh, teams would do to get to away games. But they decided to catch a boat boat down the East Coast, I guess. Uh, That is very interesting and quite a fun fact, if you ask me. All right. Chief Osingloa, the Florida State mascot, who rides out and uh, plants a flaming sphere in the middle of the field before each home game has been approved by Florida's Seminole Indian tribe. So, you know, they're, you know, they're Seminoles and they're the Indians. And I guess they probably actually collaborated with them on, like, the actual, you know, tradition of it. They probably actually get a person that actually uh, is of that origin to make sure everything's legit so they didn't end up like, you know, the Washington football team. And, you know, be ostracized and told that they got to fix themselves. All right. Uh, did you know in 19 in the 1940s, college bowl games also included the raisin bowl, the salad bowl and the oil bowl? <laughs> um, I don't know if they were trying to be funny or not, but that's what it is. 
Um, during the 1990s, Prairie View College put together an 80-game losing streak. One season, they were uh, outscored each game by an average of 56 to four. Jesus Christ. Um, I am familiar with Prairie View, and I'm sad to hear that that's how many games they lost in a row. Like, imagine being on those football teams. Matter of fact, I'm pretty sure if they anybody that played on the teams never spoke of it. Okay? Like, never. We're just not going to talk about it. Uh, anybody that wants to be in the league probably never went to there. Um, they were just, it was probably like a high school team, you know, just got to walk on and be a part of it. Um, I wonder if they still just got like, you know, the local fame. <laughs> Who knows? Uh, okay. Let's see. The most laterals in a game was eight. Came during a Michigan, the Michigan Wolverines, uh, final play of the Alamo Bowl back in 2005. That's cool. I mess with that. Uh, before every home game, flowers are placed at the graves of every former UGA, so uh, University of Georgia uh, football player. Okay. Um, the four pass first appeared in the college football world in 1906. It was introduced in an attempt to increase scoring and reduce injuries. Smart. Look at them thinking. All right. Uh, Yale has won more national championships, 18, than any other college football team. Their last title was back in 1927. Well, that's not fair. It was probably the only team, you know, that could even make it happen back then. But I guess, if you say so. Uh, so record margins of victory, uh, college football's largest margin of victory came in 1916 when Georgia Tech defeated Cumberland by a score of 222 to zero. The game was court cut short by 15 minutes. The game should have been cut short by an hour, 20, 222 to zero. N- no, 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 no. They wrong for, I don't care what time it was. I don't care if it was 1916. Y'all wrong. Okay, I'm somebody that loves the sport, and yes, I think there should be mercy rules in certain situations, and if a team is losing by 200 points, that's a certain situation. That is ridiculous. 200 point, 100 points is ridiculous. Y'all should have, that game should have been done in the first quarter, or at, did they score every time they got the ball? I am confused on how this was allowed. What in, okay, look, everybody involved, in that situation, wrong. All right. Uh, the orange and white team colors of the Tennessee Volunteers were chosen in 1891 to represent the daisies which uh, grow on the campus. Well, that's sweet. That's nice. Uh, real cute. <laughs> President John F. Kennedy compared the difficulties of reaching space in a rocket to Rice Owl's chances of defeating the Texas Longhorns. I don't believe I live in Houston, so that's just entertaining. I mean, I guess you could say Rice and Texas are like, you know, rivals, local rivals. I know that's a big rivalry, but like, you know, it's one of those big ones because it's local. Uh, and the t- both schools are like prestige, you know, as far as education purposes. But I didn't know John F. Kennedy ever say anything about that, but he ain't had to put them out there like that. That's kind of cold. <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, field goals in college football were originally worth five points. I didn't know that. Uh, this was decreased to four points in 19, uh, 1904 and three points in 1909. So just, just kept getting lower and lower. Just poor kickers thought that. I mean, it was definitely been a bigger part of the team until they, people just keep knocking their numbers down. You hate to see it. Okay. Uh, the Wisconsin Badgers once had a real-life Badger as their mascot. It wasn't a little guy. Uh, in a suit uh during games it would be uh led around the sidelines on a leash which i didn't know you could put a badger on a leash uh the animal proved to to be too mean and it was replaced with a costume guy back in 1940 uh they tried to domesticate a wild animal like that and it just backfired no surprise there i'm sure Peta was all over y'all though Peta Peta, whatever you want to call it <clears throat> okay. Um, during Nebraska Cornhuskers home games, their stadium becomes the state's third largest city. <laughs> That's how many people be in there. Jeez. Uh, 
the Red River shout out between Oklahoma and Texas, which happens during the uh, happens during the fair, is the oldest rival played at a neutral site. The game is held in Dallas, like I said, uh, during the fair, which is halfway between both campuses. Oh, okay. Uh, Oklahoma was still a U.S. territory when the Red River shout-out started in the 1900. Uh, Oklahoma didn't receive statehood until 1907, so that makes it a little more interesting. <laughs> Oop, let's talk about some Aggies, man. Okay, in 1915, a group of Aggie supporters placed a band on the Longhorn steer of a of Texas uh, of a Texas student. Okay, it, the the brand 13 to zero represented A and M's 1915 win over the Longhorns, and in an effort to cover up the brand, the owner turned the one turned the one of the three into the letter B. And then came up with Bevo. <laughs> so that's how he got the name. Uh, this became the school's mascot, although the original Bevo was later eaten. That is sad. I don't know if we need to put the eaten part in there. We could we could we could left that off, man. That, that that's just sad. Um, the number of players fielded by each college team was reduced to twenty in eighteen seventy three. It was reduced to fifteen in 1875 and then it to its current 11 in 1880 can you imagine 20 people almost what in the world that sounds so dangerous oh my goodness i know there were so many injuries there had to be okay so there are four and actually i think this is updated but originally it was four college Football stadiums, which held more than 100,000 fans, which was Penn State's Beaver Stadium, uh, the University of Tennessee's Nyland Stadium, the University of Michigan's Stadium, and Ohio State Stadium. But now, I believe Texas A&M Kyle Field also holds that amount, too. These might be needed to be updated. College football fields were originally 120 yards long, which, I mean, you probably needed that since you have 20 people on both sides of the ball for some reason uh, and 100 yards wide uh, like I said that that was probably needed for all of those people y'all decided to have on that field but that is a lot of room I ain't gonna lie uh, a lot of running I'd be tired it probably affects the records books too because you know how many yards people rushing and passing for when you got those extra yards like that uh, interesting enough in the beginning uh, the balls used to use for college football were, were round. Okay, so I don't know how that worked, but that don't sound cool. And touchdowns in college football were originally counted as three points. So thank goodness they made that a little more, you know, achievable, right? Okay. Um, the first college football game was broadcast on television in 1939. The teams involved were Fordham University and Waynesburg College. I would have definitely been tuned into that back in 39 if I was alive and uh, it's sports like I am now because that would have been, I know I know that was a big moment for them. In the 1985 Orange Bowl, Oklahoma received a 15-yard penalty due to the Sooner Schooner? The Sooner Schooner, uh, a covered wagon pulled by two uh, people, like two uh, horses with people like controlling them. Raced onto the field to celebrate an OU field goal, which has been waved off. After the penalty was assessed, OU missed the next attempt and went on to lose the game. So, that had to suck. I'm pretty sure the coach was furious. <laughs> Quarterbacks from Alabama won the first three Super Bowls. They also have more Super Bowl wins than quarterbacks from any other school. Um, those three were... Kenny Stabler, Joe Namath, and Bart Starr. But you know, like I said, hey, they they stay just Alabama pushes these guys out. They they make them in a laboratory or something, I'm convinced. Uh this is something I knew because I went to this school. This is my alma mater, but um Reveille, you know, the college mascot for a Texas AM football team, or really everybody is the mascot for Texas AM. Uh it's a commission. It's commissioned as a five-star general in the military. Yeah, I don't know how that worked, 
I don't know what tours they have this dog on, but I'm pretty sure if that dog ever went to war, it'd come back with all kinds of PTSD and would not be happy with that cannon they shoot when they score in the stadium. <laughs> okay. Uh, next up, if a college team played in a bowl game in 1954, they were banned from any bowl games in 1955. This was dis- <laughs> designed to give every team a chance to play. What are we in? Little League? Is that what this is? It's terrible. That's a terrible rule. I'm glad they're done with that because we would not have this era of Clemson and Georgia and uh, Alabama, Oklahoma. You wouldn't be able to see these guys. Oregon, the people that's like usually competing. Throughout the 1960s, the University of Florida kept up a real kept a real life alligator name Albert on the sidelines so everybody just believed that they could just have a real one. I, I feel like everybody just wanted to show out because I believe LSU had a tiger at some point too and it's just not right guys you can't just be keeping these animals like that but uh, during a period in the 1950s the national championship was selected prior to the bowl games being played in 1950 Oklahoma was named the national championship named the national champions despite the fact that they would later lose their bowl game so that, that just like oh here goes you know these are the champions because they how you did the season but here goes the bowl game and they lost so somebody was clearly better than them so now we look like idiots mm-hmm. yeah I bet so remember that stat I said about PV uh, going for 80 game losing streak in the 90s well let's talk about who did the opposite the Miami Hurricanes hold a record of 82 consecutive weeks where a former Hurricane scored a touchdown in an NFL game all right so that's a better look at an 80 consecutive situation. Instead of losing 80 straight games, let's talk about 82 consecutive weeks of you having players in the NFL score a touchdown. That, I'm pretty sure, is a big ups to specific people that probably scored every week. But uh, they, they they produce some people too, man. Alabama and then I'd say number two, Miami, is where it's at, where they produce people. All right. Let's get into it. Let's get into it. I hope y'all are having fun, man. Learning some stuff that you ain't never heard before. Uh, all right. Um, this one's a little kind of sad, but like before they really had the research that they needed, and clearly they were playing with too many people on the field. In 1905, 18 men were killed in college football games, and 159 were permanently injured. Aren't we glad how far we came, man? I mean, we know it's a dangerous sport, super dangerous, and people have their feelings about it, and there's so much research going into it as far as CT and things of that nature. But, like, just look at that. Like, you know, I'm pretty sure that even almost felt normal to them. There probably wasn't even that much controversy. I mean, let that happen today. Let, in 2021, we go through a season and 18 men were killed while playing and 159 paralyzed or something that's permanent so they can never play again. It'd be the end of the NFL right now. I'll tell you that. So, we thank God for progress. Um, College teams were penalized 15 yards for an incomplete forward pass in 1910. So, you used to get penalized for sucking. Doesn't that suck? (laughs) That, That makes it so much worse. Oh, my goodness. Like, what? You're telling me because I can't catch... That my team has to go back further and make it harder for us to get there. That is a terrible. What? Who was writing this stuff back then, man? Oh, I'm so glad we've come around and gotten this back right. Okay. Uh, the first bowl game, later known as the Rose Bowl, was played in Jane on January 1st, so New Year's, uh, in 1902 between the Michigan Wolverines and the Stanford Cardinals. Uh, Michigan won 49 to zero. Jeesh. Uh, Michigan, speaking of Michigan, uh, cornerback Charles Woodson was the first Heisman Trophy winner not to play an offensive position. Uh, the award was handed out since 1935. Uh, it did not go to a defensive player until Woodson in 97. So, you know, Charles was going off. Char- Charles had to go crazy to get that, in case y'all didn't know. Okay. Uh, not surprised there. Did what he had to do. Okay, uh, the first American college team to play on foreign soil uh, was the LSU Tigers in 1907. They took on Havana University in the inaugural 
Bacardi Bowl and defeated them 56 to 0. All right. The annual Florida Georgia game is considered by many to be the world's largest tailgate party. The game takes place on Saturday, of course, but many fans begin arriving on Wednesday and don't leave until Sunday. It's a party. It's a party. It's a party. Hey, they doing their thing, man. I ain't mad at them. That's dope, though. Uh, while playing for the University of Hawaii from 2000 to 2004, quarterback Timmy Chung set an NCAA passing record with 17,072 yards. That's what happens when you stay in college, guys, and don't just go to the league, man. You, you know, make you a little history. <laughs> stay there for a little while, rack up them, them stats. And then you look, look cool forever because you're on like random pages like this and get spoke about on a random podcast by this random guy that lives in a random place in a random office studio. <laughs> All right. Hey, um, let's talk about some more interesting stuff here, man. Uh, during the 1979 Cotton Bowl game, Notre Dame quarterback Joe Montana began suffering from hypothermia. That's how cold it was. Jesus Christ. As a remedy, he was fed chicken soup. The soup bowl and spoon were now are now in the uh, College Football Hall of Fame. <laughs> that is the weirdest thing. Like, the stuff that people, like, want to see. Like, oh, can we put that on display in the museum? Um, sure. But, yeah, no. Come on, Joe. What? What? Who even had chicken soup just sitting ready to be warmed anyway? I guess. Okay. Um, The first organized cheerleading yell was performed on the Princeton campus in 1880. Princeton was a big part of college football's growth, man. I don't know if y'all knew that. Oh, this one. Wait, what? During, During important plays of the game... Some members of the Texan A&M Cadet Corp would squeeze their testicles. What? I'm. You know what? I'm sorry, y'all. I'm. I'm just hoping that that is fake. Cause why? Why? I, I, that literally makes no sense to me. Anyways, all right. This is a fact that you need to pay attention. If you're not paying attention, listen closely. Are you listening? I hope you're listening. Bobby Greer. Who's Bobby Greer? Have you heard of Bobby Greer? Well, you heard of him now. Bobby Greer, an African-American fullback and linebacker for the Pittsburgh Panthers way back when, became the first player to break the color barrier of the Sugar Bowl in 1956. Salute that man. All right. Ted, the first real-life bear mascot. Here we go with those real mascots again uh, for Baylor, was donated in 1917 by a local businessman who won him in a poker game. So it was a bear that somebody put on as a bet and lost. And this guy won a bear <laughs> and donated him to the school to be the mascot. What? Come on. Waco. What's, what's going on out there, Waco? That's, that's weird stuff, man. That's weird stuff. <laughs> but I guess cool, cool. Uh, Notre Dame has produced more All-American all Americans than any other D one school. Hmm. I guess I gotta put them up there too. Then with you know, the Bamas and the Miamis of the world. In 1961, Ernie Davis of Syracuse became the first African American to win the Heisman Trophy. Ernie Davis, shout out 1961. Remember that, folks. You heard it here. All right. Uh, when the University of Texas achieves a win over rival Texas A and M, the UT Tower is bathed in orange lights. Okay, who cares? We don't care. I don't know why that's even on here. <laughs> All jokes, guys. Uh, Notre Dame has only had 12 losing seasons out of 118, or like the first 118, I guess. Um, the longest field goal in college football was 69 yards. That was by Ove Johannesson of Abilene Christian back in 1976. That's a dope one. That's really cool that he can even kick that far. Because let me tell you how far I can kick. It'd be a sad, sad day. Whenever a dog serving as Reverly for Texas A&M passes away, she is buried in a special cemetery at the north end of the school stadium. Yes, there's this little doggy. Uh 
planted area. And, you know, they make it look nice, though. But it's just sad to know that there's dead dogs in there when you think about it. <clears throat> just saying. All right. Uh, the record for most consecutive games without being shut out belongs to BYU. They uh, went 361 games over 28 years without being shut out. The NCAA banned the kicking tee in 1988 and required kicks to be from the ground from then on. Uh, what were they mad about? Nothing. They just wanted to say stuff, I guess. Uh, and the last one I'm going to go ahead and do, just because this one is just another way to pay respect, uh, I do also want to say rest in paradise to uh, Paul Bear Bryant. But something that happened with him is uh, once he was quoted, and he said specifically, I'd probably – uh, croak in a week if I ever quit coaching and he unfortunately did pass 27 days after his last game he coached right so I guess he knew himself best that's for sure but hey man like I said there, those are a couple fun facts that we want to just you know throw out there for the NCAA throw out there for you guys see if you learned some see if there's some stuff you knew in there I wonder how many you knew and then if you didn't know now you know go talk about it and tell some friends at the barbershop or when you get back home man um thank you for tuning in man as always it's been a pleasure uh I appreciate you guys tuning into the GSMC football podcast brought to you by GSMC Podcast Network. I would like to ask for you to remember to subscribe to us, uh, show some love, uh, write some reviews, tell me what you think about the show, what you think about me. Uh, definitely trying to get better here. Also, if you can please follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram, GSMC underscore football. Uh, shoot, you can really go look into anything, GSMC underscore, like the first thing that comes to your mind, type it in, and we probably got a podcast about it. Learn more about us, man. Check us out. Uh, a lot of great talent going around and building uh, within this network. i love for you guys to check it out. But thank you. Good morning, good evening, good night. As I always say, farewell. Everybody have a good one. You've been listening to the Golden State Media Concepts Football Podcast, part of the Golden State Media Concepts Podcast Network. You can find this show and others like it at www.gsmcpodcast.com. Download our podcast on iTunes, Stitcher, SoundCloud, and Google Play. Just type in GSMC to find all the shows from the Golden State Media Concepts Podcast Network from movies to music from sports to entertainment and even weird news you can also follow us on twitter and on facebook thank you and we hope you have enjoyed today's program